Welcome back. I'm Nancy Montoya, and this is Behind the A. We're doing a special, uh, a special segment in Behind the A where we're talking to local Tucson authors. Um, and we really want to give them a little bit more publicity, and we want local people to understand that we have some fantastic authors here in Tucson. One of them is my good friend over here, Lydia Otero. How are you? I'm doing well. Oh, Lydia started uh, uh, with your first real known book was back in what, 2011? In 2010, I wrote La Calle, and it was about urban renewal and the destruction of the 80 acres downtown. And it's still one of those books that's relevant that the people use and refer to. So that was a great start for me as an author to launch that book because it's given me this platform where people are interested in subsequent books that I write because, and, but I'm always known by La Calle. People say, yes. oh, you're the one that wrote La Calle. And you know, La Calle had such an impact because it, for the first time, really showed the devastation mm -hmm. of, of the barrios. Barrio Viejo was affected. What mm -hmm. were some of the other barrios? Uh, Membrillo disappeared. disappeared. Yeah, and it, parts of El Oyo disappeared. And it wasn't only the 80 acres to build the Tucson at that time, the Tucson Community Center Convention Center, it was all that parking, right? Because yeah. the, the idea of multi-level parking wasn't implemented. I don't know if it was purposeful, but it was all these sprawling, empty parking lots that we see. And today, we're using it for the Rock and Mineral Show. Right. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was devastating, and people remembered it. I remember it as a child. So. Uh, the interesting part is the more time passes, there'll be less people that actually remember La Calle. Yeah, so, isn't that crazy? Yeah. Now, the, your next book was In the Shadow of the Freeway. Mm -hmm. it, it, let's just relive a little bit okay, of that before right, we right. get to your new book. Yeah, uh, so I left the U of A. I took incentivized retirement, and I didn't have to write peer-reviewed books. So I always wanted to write this memoir. Um, and I wrote In the Shadows of the Freeway because I was raised in a neighborhood that was erased because of the I-10. Mm -hmm. uh, right where 22nd meets I-10, that my, my mother, the house that my mother built actually wow. with her sisters while my father was in World War II. It's still there. Uh, we no longer own it. We let it go in 20, after my mother passed in 2022. But there's so many memories of that area and in fact, I had to attend a school two miles away. I had to attend Maryland School because the, the, build, the building of the freeway actually changed school boundaries. Whereas my, my brothers and sisters got to just walk to school. Cross I had street, to take yeah. the bus and go to a different school. So it really impacted my life in terms of just isolate. I felt isolated on this side of the freeway when all the stores were on the other side of the freeway. Right. And it was this story I felt like needed, it needed to be told from the perspective that I remember it. And so as a historian, I tell it from, I use my voice to tell this story, but I also incorporate historical documents. Well, the subtitle to that book is uh, Growing Up Brown and Queer. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, the Latino community, as we all know, is mm -hmm. extremely conservative. And mm -hmm. for many, many moons, uh, if you were uh, homosexual, lesbian, mm -hmm. whatever, queer, whatever the term is, uh, you were ostracized and, and very often thrown out of the, the family, mm -hmm. uh, or at least an embarrassment to the family. How things have changed, haven't right. they? Right. Tell me a little bit about in the beginning yeah. when you wrote this book, and then today, the kind of life you're living today. Right, yeah. Well, you could tell why the, the title is indicative of the book, but also the photo that I chose to, uh, as the cover photo, uh, it's one of the few photographs of me wearing pants because it was always a battle because my mother believed that I should be a girl. Uh, my family believed uh, I should be a girl. And we had people knocking at our door, uh, stopping and saying, hey, you should make Lydia look more like a girl. So this community surveillance wow. was really heavy. And of course, I had to wear dresses uh, all through elementary school, junior high school, and high school. You did too, right? Yes, It absolutely. was mandated, yes. mandated by the school district. There was no option to wear pants. And so, I mean, it was just a different time. Uh, I would say that my family 
preferred not talking about it. They weren't um, cool about it. I wasn't, uh, there was still a lot of love in my family yeah. towards me. Uh, but in terms of the public face, there was this thing that Mexicanos have to grapple with, with all Latina people, this thing called vergüenza, right? Yeah, yeah. So the, where they just don't talk about these issues. So that's in the book, my mother trying to uh, make peace with it. My mother was born in 1913. Okay. So to have a gender nonconforming child like me was a challenge. Yeah. I don't want to cut her a break, but it was a challenge. Yeah. There were no books that she could look up or, or you examples, know, people yeah, to, right. yeah, mentors. So she did, I mean, we worked it out, but uh, when I graduated high school in 1973, uh, I had to leave Tucson just to be queer. Um, just, I knew that I had to leave uh, because first of all, I had my sister, my mother had six sisters. They were, oh, they yeah. were all always somewhere and they'd run it. I'd run into them everywhere I was. Yes. So it was all the, this, the being watched, the surveillance was strong. So I left for Los Angeles and, and, and that's this, the book that I uh, recently released last year about LA interchanges where I got to be myself. It's a memoir. That's really Lydia being Lydia. Yes. Yes. Authentic. Yes. I, I aim to be, but even in this book, I also include historical documents. That's why I call it an archival memoir. My mother was a mem uh, an archivist. I really do think, because she saved all these documents, yeah. uh, every single funeral card, um, and I think what she did, and, and it was important documents. Yeah. So that helped me write my first book. So then I became like her, and I saved documents that I thought were important. So when I wrote L.A. Interchanges, I looked to my, uh, I used my own archives. That's why I call it an archival memoir, because mm -hmm. I activate my, my documents and my photographs by incorporating them into this book. Uh, and even the cover. The first book is in the shadows of the freeway, yes. and in this new book, I'm on top of the freeway. I'm using the freeway it's to this serve. This one, right? Yes. Yes, yes. I'm using the freeway to serve my needs, my wants. Well, you look like you're 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 the overseer of the freeway yeah, instead right. of in I'm the, the shadow of it. Yeah, right. I'm the boss of the freeway in this <laughs> book. So in this book, you know, I I am active in. Uh, Lesbian of color activism. I was active in gay and lesbian Latinos Unidos that, back then. And uh, um, so I chronicle my transformation as, and my consciousness. Yeah. When I arrived in Los Angeles, I was looking for brown queers like me. Yeah. Yeah, you're I, looking for a community. Yes. Yeah. But I wasn't looking just for queer community because I, I didn't want to organize with white queers. Yeah. I, I wanted to organize with brown queers. I wanted to organize with queers who saw, uh, who, who wanted to be part of the larger Chicano movement, but weren't so included, who knew who Cesar Chavez was, wanted to support the grape strikes. And I found, found that organization in Gay and Lesbian Latinos Unidos, and I was active for the, with them for a while, and I was president. So a lot of the book is talking about, or not talking, but explaining my transformation of arriving, making some mistakes, um, when, and not knowing what I'm going to do, which path I'm going to take, but the, 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 the want and need to go in a certain direction. Because I think that young people are hard on themselves. Like they think now, at 20, I was 23 when I moved to Los Angeles. Uh -huh. I think that young people at 23, they think they should know what they want to be. And I know from personal experience that, that sometimes that doesn't happen. I'm almost 70 and I still don't know what I want <laughs> yeah. to be when I grow up. Yeah. yeah. When you talk about young people, have you seen the impact that this book and all your writings and just the way you look at life as brown and queer, mm -hmm. has that had a, an impact on younger people? Have you heard from them? Yes, I think so. I think uh, I have. It's, it's very touching. Uh, and uh, I think they're looking for elders. It was hard for me to move into that category, yes. elder, <laughs> right? But I am a queer elder. And they don't have that many that are out. And that were out in the 70s and the 80s, or that were activists in the 70s and the 80s. So uh, they're looking to me in a way that I, it took me a while to recognize. Right. And, uh, and so to just, in a capsule, 
I think in me they see their survival. Wow. They the see, future maybe? And if, yeah, they feel more grounded when they know there's people like me. Uh, and that, and uh, I think they're very thankful. I think, but I think they just want more, more stories about people like me. What was it like in the 70s? What was it like right. in the 80s? And they want those stories. They're really, they're really supportive of that. And uh, uh, most, I'm on social media, on Instagram, and most of the people that follow me are young people. Right. And because they want, and they, and I hear from them, I wish you would post more. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> I think I post too much. And they're like, we like your photos. And they just like seeing the past. Right. Because it, it, they've, they've seen the past in terms of a heterosexual, heteronormative world. They mm -hmm. want to see what it was like to be a brown queer and about their, that history. Is the community, the queer community, brown and queer community, different in LA from Tucson? Or are there many similarities? Or how are they different? Well, I think they're, they're more, uh, they, they can organize around brown queerness more than they do here. I don't know, uh, for example, this weekend I, um, I'm headed to Los Angeles and I'm gonna take part in the queer mercado. So they take over the LA, uh, East LA Civic Center and they just have a queer mercado with all of these qu brown queers, queers in general, uh -huh. but targeting brown queers that make crafts and that but have But it's open puestos. to the whole community. It's open to the whole community, but it's a queer mercado. <laughs> that in itself says something, right? That they're able to have that niche or that specialized um, group of people. So LA, I think in terms of its size, also, social media allows people to connect now in ways that we didn't, we weren't able to. While you, you write about being brown and being queer in, in almost everything you do, but you also write about some of the injustices towards the, the Chicano community. Right. I use the term Chicano because in the 70s, that's what we were. We mm -hmm. were Chicanos. Now it's Mexican Americans, Hispanic, right. and of course now Latinx. Um, why did you feel that call to to really make that public that there were injustices happening in how the the neighborhoods were being destroyed? Right. You I lived think, through it, didn't right, you? Right. I think so. And I was, and we are of the similar generation, yeah. where I started to read about Chicano, and it was the Chicano movement, movement. in junior high school. And, and when I started, when I learned about it, it was like a light bulb. It was like I have a place. There's there's a platform for me. I'm at that time, I now identify as non-binary, trans non-binary, but back then I was a Chicana, right? Yeah. And and just saying I'm a Chicana, I had an identity. There was power in yeah, that word, right. wasn't there? And I could stand up and say I'm a Chicana and and so that I've had since I um, since I was in junior high school at Wakefield Junior High School here in Tucson. So I always felt empowered by this politic. Uh, and uh, so even when I said I went to Los Angeles and I didn't want to organize with white queers, uh -huh. I, I wanted to organize with people who look like me. And what, had, what was you know, that? that I mean, there's what? no translation, right? It's just like we're the same people. It's, it's also empowering to see yourself and to have these conversations where you don't have to say, and, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, when I taught in, at the University of Arizona, you know, I was willing to teach and I was a teacher, but now I want to be around people that I learn from. And right. some of those people are young people because they're just, they're so advanced now. They need to know so much. They're into so much more than I was at their age. I find them really inspiring. But some people might argue that uh, by seeking out only uh, the brown community, that, that you isolate yourself, and that the, the Anglo or the white community is missing out on your knowledge, missing out on your experiences by targeting uh, the brown community. Did, did that ever happen, or did it spill over into? Yeah, you know, I've heard that, but I don't care. <laughs> you know, I don't care. You know, I, I want to, uh, write books that resonate with people like me, mm -hmm. uh, people that perhaps are, will find power in my story. Um, I, I must say that uh, my, my LA Interchanges was just released. Right. Uh, 
And my book release party was at the LA Central Library, which has given me a lot of support. And my support isn't just brown queers. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people that are interested in other people's experiences. And um, some of them, okay, some straight white people have read my book and they can, they can relate to dancing and disco yeah, and because yeah. it's in my book, sure. right? They can, but they, I think that they appreciate that story, but I don't write my books for them. I, I write books. And that's okay. And it is in my world, it's okay. In other worlds, it may be like, you, uh, yeah, because if I try to write my book so it, it would resonate with, with people that aren't like me, I would feel like I would shortchange uh, my readers wow. or the intent of my work. Sure. And finally, uh, you're here for the Tucson Festival of Books. Yeah. Uh, 2024 mm -hmm. Tucson Festival of Books. Why is it important to have this kind of an outlet to come to, to meet people one-on-one -on -one and see people? Mm -hmm. Why is that important to you? Well, it's, it's, it's Tucson, right? Yeah. I'm always proud of these kinds of events that celebrate books. Uh, I think, too, that uh, there's a session uh, that you're probably going to talk to some people, but there's actually a unique session that's going to be three Tucson writers from Tucson. And we're going to talk about what it's, like, what it's like to be from Tucson and to write books. And that, that's just exciting to me because that's a conversation that I've never had. Right. And I think people want to hear because we need more stories about Tucson. We need more writers to write about Tucson. Tucson yeah, Isn't right. that what the... the yeah, uh, yeah. Um, wow, that would be a great one to attend. Yeah. Um, well, I am so happy that uh, you have uh, come here to share a little bit about your Thank life you, and Nancy. your books. I've always been a, a really Thank an you. admirer of you, your courage, and your, your intellectual capacity to look at life. And I think that's something that we can all learn from, brown, queer, or white, <laughs> anything. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. We'll be back in a little bit with another author.